This is Let Me Sum Up, your regular deep dive into recent reports on climate and energy. I'm Luke Menzel, recording today on Wurundjeri Land, and I'm joined, as always, by my two co-hosts, the exceptional Alison Reeve. G'day, Alison. Hey, Luke. Coming to you from Ngunnawal country tonight. And the ghost of climate future, Tenant Reed. G'day, Tenant. Hello. I've uh, I've just about recovered from my, my ghostly episode uh, at the Carbon Market Institute Emission Reduction Summit <laughs> and I'm ready to go back to sunny optimism. <laughs> Your turn as a spectral prophet of climate misfortune at the summit was, was both hilarious and I reckon actually pretty well aligned with some of the scenarios contemplated in today's paper. <laughs> <laughs> They don't quite get to the arseless chaps, but they're not far off. <laughs> You're going to have us in the X-rated section. Yes. Well, that's where we belong. <laughs> <laughs> On this week's show, we look at a report that attempts to deploy the power of storytelling to enable better business decision making on climate change. But first, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak caused widespread consternation in climate circles last week when he watered down a raft of regulations aimed at supporting the UK's transition to a net zero economy. The Prime Minister describes it as sensible green leadership, but critics reckon he is playing politics with climate ahead of a tough re-election campaign in 2024. What do you reckon, Alison? Oh, boy. Um... <laughs> I was so disappointed in in so many ways, Um, starting with the fact that the announcement was cancelling some stuff that was never going to happen anyway. So, Mm. you you know, he's not going to tax meat, which was never on the agenda. He's not going to make people have seven different bins to sort their rubbish into, which was never on the agenda. We also cancelled the um, Great British Insulation program and pushed back the ban on internal combustion engines from 2030 to 2035, I think. Now, 2035 is still just okay if you want to get to net zero by 2050, but it's disappointing from the perspective that the UK actually had been a real leader in lots of ways um, on this stuff and someone that, you know, I think countries like Australia was at, were actually looking to with some... Um, from my perspective, a great deal of envy, actually. Mm. It's hard to tell if this is just a, you know, a, a bit of a spasm to try and win back a few votes from somewhere or if it's sort of cracks appearing in the consensus that the UK has had for so long about climate change. Yeah, it's interesting, particularly on that phase out of uh, internal combustion engines. Um, it was really interesting to watch the UK government sort of deploy regulation to shape markets over the last uh, last number of years. And um, for a conservative government, that's quite a big deal, but also the way they, that they sold it. And they sold it <laughs> at times as a market mechanism. So mm. phasing out inter- internal combustion engines a market mechanism because you're setting kind of the rules of the road of what's acceptable behaviour in the market and then you're letting the market invest uh, in the uh, the next generation technologies that will allow that target to be met and having clarity about when that phase out takes uh, place incredibly important. I mean, we were pleased when I think it was Boris Johnson um, moved the target um, back uh, from 2035 to 2030. It's now back at 2035. We now face the prospect that an incoming Labor government could move it back to 2030 again. I don't know. Like, it's it's all a bit of a mess, right? Yeah, and you saw it. There were some, some very pointed and sharp comments from the Ford company, um, mm. sort of as close as a company gets to shouting in a politician's face, what the hell do you think you're doing? Um <laughs> But one of the things that they they said, which is very widely reported, is to say that they want three things from the UK government. They want ambition, they want commitment, and they want consistency. And, um, I mean, this is something we've been very used to in Australia is businesses calling for certainty. Mm. Um, And I think what we're seeing here with the UK is just how much consternation there is not just in climate circles, but also in industrial circles as well, when you start to fiddle around with that consistency. Yeah, it it is. It's a very messy situation. And I think if there is, as the polls really suggest there will be, but who knows, a change of government in the UK at their next election, which is 
is still a remarkably way off given mm. how uh, how many twists and turns uh, the the UK and Prime Ministers the UK has been with since the last election. Hang on, hang on, glass houses and stone. You know <laughs> yeah, well, having lived through many of the things uh, sort of going on in the UK, maybe we can maybe we can recognise some of what's going on. But for the next government uh, to reverse as like especially a an internal combustion engine phase out uh with by that point maybe five years notice mm-hmm. that's a big call too um it, it it is very very messy when when governments set up big things and then uh retreat a bit from them and like what what is their word worth what is the currency of of ambition um I do also think, though, that like there are a few things going on here. You've got a a government that, uh, like, what two two prime ministers back, Bojo uh, was not a details man, not a man from his Brexit history, particularly concerned with extremely robust evidence for his pronouncements. Or even consistency. Indeed, indeed. And and he had committed the UK to a lot of stuff and said, oh, it's all going to be great. It's all going to be fine. Uh, and as much as like it, it's very weird and absurd to see the UK government ruling out things that were never going to happen, which is like interpretable as a... Um, we're trying to satisfy some some angry people uh, with with things that we're kind of making up, uh, rather than cutting more things that are real. Maybe they are doing a bit of of clean up of from the the Boris era, but they're also like as you say trying to trying to appeal to somebody to hang by their fingernails on at the next election and. I don't, I don't know if it's going to work, but um, it's a mess. Yeah, I mean the the by election that they held in Boris Johnson's old seat, um, Uxbridge, they won that seat by five hundred votes, and it did seem that a thing called ULEV was a issue at that by election. ULEV stands for ultra low emissions vehicle, and this is basically a local government policy within the city of London that creates this zone. Um, that you have to pay to drive in unless you've got an ultra low emissions vehicle, effectively an electric car. And that started out being in the centre of London and has recently expanded sort of right out to the the edges of the, the metropolitan area. And it's now picking up a lot more people who um, drive for a living and a lot more people who have fewer public transport office um, options. So there's been a lot of pushback against it and that came up Um, in that particular by-election. So it's possible that there, you know, someone somewhere has sniffed that there might be a whiff of a few votes around, you know, winding back green policies on the basis that they were, that there was some overreach going on. Yeah. And, and a lot of the, um, the rhetoric around this sort of points to, you know, not making people do anything. Um, And that extends to things like the, the mandate on uh, energy efficiency in rental properties yeah. um, that was being phased oh, in, shame. which is absolutely tragic, right? Um, yeah. The health implications, the implications for energy poverty uh, are just um, uh, too awful to contemplate, and yet it plays into this narrative of um, the, the government sort of letting people, you know, chart their own course um, and, and reminds me a little bit of the debate that played out um, in Germany over the last couple of years now. Yeah. I think that the German government largely navigated through some choppy waters to a reasonable outcome that sort of delayed some fairly ambitious targets around the phase out of gas boilers and the like. And this seems of a, uh, a policy change of of a different stripe, but it do, it does point to the challenges for for politicians and politics and um, durable public support when you're you're starting to to get into people's homes and starting to get to sort of shape the kinds of decisions they have available to them that uh, they're quite kind of used to be able to making certain types of choices and, and perhaps they're not choices that are, are, are really possible for them to make if we're serious about driving towards that net zero economy. I think that's right. But some of the things that got wound back in Sunak's announcement were, um, were fiscal measures, mm. were things like 
you know, rebates for boilers and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so I think there's also in some ways an austerity drive here as well because the UK budget is in a dreadful state. Like just about everything else in the UK right now. <laughs> True that. And, you know, the, the Conservatives have always had this position of, I, I guess, they position themselves as the better economic managers in, mm-hmm. the, in the UK political context. So I think there was also potentially a desire to save some money there mm-hmm. as well. But, I mean, that's in some ways that's disappointing as well because, you know, net zero is not going to happen for free. We, we are going to have to spend money on it, guys. Um, mm. And the longer you put off spending that money, the more the expensive it's going to be. So uh, just, my goodness, two years ago, uh, Bojo was telling us that, sorry, Kermit, you're wrong. It is easy being green. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, declaring that, uh, what was it, coal, cars, cash, and I forget what the the final uh, leg of his sturdy table of British international climate commitment was. But an enormous amount of British prestige went into Glasgow. Mm. Yes. And the shine's coming off that prestige right about now. And, you know, we're a couple of years on from there, uh, I don't know that it's immediately disastrous for international negotiations, but it's um, it's not a great look for the UK trying to exercise some some influence in the international arena, and it it is certainly not a great look for trying to encourage countries to go further rather than just not backslide at COP twenty eight. You heard it here first. Tenant Reid says, bring back Boris Johnson. Ah. Hang on, easy, Tiger. <laughs> you belong on Fleet Street with an attitude like that. Uh, shall we chat about a report? Yes. Yeah, because we need some cheering up. The Real World Climate Scenarios Initiative is a multidisciplinary group concerned that the climate scenarios used by policymakers and financial regulators are rubbish in general and particularly bad at supporting businesses to make good decisions on climate change. They argue that the near-term physical impacts of climate change are well understood and that the scenarios used by businesses should instead focus on other significant variables such as policy ambition, economic circumstances, technology development and societal views, as these are far more material variables for business decision making, especially in the near term. It is this philosophy that is on show in a new report titled No Time to Lose, New Scenario Narratives for Action on Climate Change. In it, a team at the University of Exeter lays out their critique of the climate scenarios used in standard economic modelling and share four narrative scenarios that they were commissioned to create for one of the largest pension schemes in the UK. This is an unusual report, Tennant. What did you make of it? So, I felt multidimensionally unsatisfied after reading this report. And I don't know if that's yet a fair judgment because this is very much part one of who knows how many parts of further work that will build on the foundation here. And, like, this might be uh, The Hobbit, part one, an unexpected journey of climate scenario reports because it's got an all-star cast of uh, extremely talented people involved in putting it together, but it's also like a bit um, bloated and full of questionable choices, I think. (laughs) Harsh. The Hobbit is a very short book. (laughs) Bloat. I don't remember it being full of questionable choices. I'm referring to Peter Jackson's films. (laughs) Of gotcha. Okay, now I'm on board. <laughs> the book is absolutely not bloated. It does have a few too many indistinguishable dwarves. So this is The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smog. <laughs> well, it's not yet that bloated, but the bloat is coming. And there was a, there is a lot of desolation in the meltdown scenario. <laughs> that is true. There is. Um, so there's a, a piece of this report that is very correct and and convincing, um, but, you know, is also rehearsing themes that, that we have covered in previous reports in this podcast, which is that 
integrated assessment models uh, which bring together uh, economic modelling and uh, climate physics to a limited degree and try to map out how they influence each other so as to inform decision-making are terrible. (laughs) I was going to use a harsher word, but they're not good. Uh, They are incomplete in all kinds of ways, unsatisfactory, they... Uh, miss physical risk, they miss politics and policy, they miss unemployment, finance, asset prices, volatility, tipping points, path dependency and complex feedback loops. They are very bad, no good from almost any point of view and they remain absolutely central to a huge amount of work that is done on climate policy and climate risk. And uh, the Network for Greening the Financial System, which is a significant initiative for uh, boosting the amount of climate analysis that underpins investment decisions and financial regulation and so on, and is all tremendously well-intentioned, is completely dependent currently on integrated assessment models, which have evolved only modestly from the uh, uh, the DICE uh, original Nobel Prize winning model uh, of William Nordhaus that says three degrees of global warming is the optimum. Um, so, okay, yes, point made, they're no good. But then what do we do? Well, this report says... What we need to do is come up with a new set of narrative-based models, not models, in fact, narrative-based scenarios for climate change that embrace a broader range of uh, factors, relate all to the things that Luke mentioned, and provide decision-relevant spreads of possibility. And they set out four scenarios in this report, which vary on two axes. Basically, is climate policy nationally and globally uh, more or less active and coherent and positive? Uh, And are markets and economic developments outside of policy more or less climate aligned and dynamic? And they've got the everything's bad scenario and the everything's good scenario and two variations on it's a mixed world scenario. And I came away from them thinking, I don't know what anybody can do with these scenarios in a decision relevant sense because they are... Uh, they are completely narrative based. They are. We've spoken to a bunch of experts about things that might happen, and we've woven together various of their insights and musings into four stories, which share. I'm, I'm talking a lot here, but they they share a common physical basis of a yep. plausible but very much uh, fictional narrative of. Um, extreme weather events occurring throughout the 2020s. And then they say, and here's how in our story, politics reacts to all of that and a bunch of other things and economies evolve. And like, I don't know, I think you could write like four completely different stories, which also would have a veneer of plausibility to them in different ways. And I just don't know other than illustrating that, the world is a complex place and climate you know, flows through to a lot of things and clean economy development or not flows through to a lot of things. I don't know, like how would you prepare for all these scenarios? How would you prepare for uh, the the Biden administration falls as a result of not supporting <laughs> Ukraine successfully enough, which is one of the stories. And um, like Marine Le Pen uh, takes over France and uh, there's a, a frozen conflict in Ukraine and the world gets climate fever and everybody decides to uh, put away personal consumption and everybody decides that um, personal fulfilment is all there is and the hell with the climate. I I don't know, it's just too many things. But is it fewer things than doing an integrated assessment model? Well, they are nonsensically simple 
at least we can recognize more more easily that they're nonsensically simple um I, I, I come here not to to praise integrated assessment models, but I'm dissatisfied <laughs> with narratives. But not necessarily I, to bury them either. I feel like this is a new yeah. milestone in the podcast, Tenant, where we, we found a report that doesn't like integrated assessment models that you in turn don't like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is growth. <laughs> For everybody. I mean, I, I when I looked at these, I actually like – being able to read through a scenario rather than yes. have a bunch of charts that says GDP will be this or this much or mm-hmm. you know lower or higher. Mm-hmm. The underlying physical narrative that they've put in this is um, utterly terrifying when you read it all written down, um, especially when you. I think we we should have said that these are designed for just the twenty twenties. Yeah. So when they write down things like the whole Amazon is going to catch fire and that and that that's going to happen sometime in the next seven years. That's actually... Actually, actually catch fire multiple times. <laughs> multiple times, brown underpant time, right? And, I mean, it was quite interesting, I think, how each of these scenarios in some ways seems to hang off what happens in Ukraine. Yes. Or that, you know, that's kind of the key geopolitical factor that they put at the beginning of each one. Yeah. But it requires you to think through, well, what do I think will happen in Ukraine? But also, I think, what do you want to happen? Mm. Because one of the things about narratives is I think it's helpful to sort of set out, well, if you want the 2020s to look like this, these are all the things that you would need to do. So not just believe, but do. There is little that many of us can do about this, but, you you know, you would need there to be a just and lasting peace between Russia and Ukraine. You would need Biden to be re-elected. You would need multilateral development banks to be de-risking private climate investment. And so to the extent that you as a company or as, you know, an individual or whatever have any influence over that, this scenario is telling you this is what you would need to work towards. You know, this is what you need to make happen. And I think integrated assessment models don't give you that. They give you, you know, temperatures and dollars. And they're wrong about both, for sure. Yeah. I think it's it's really important to uh, underline uh, who they are creating these scenarios for. Yes. Um, they are not creating them for policymakers, although, you know, we can have a conversation about what the potential utility of these sorts of narrative-based scenarios could be for policymakers, and we should talk about that. But they are creating it for businesses that are under pressure uh, and, and in some cases are leading the charge. Uh, to put in place near-term transition plans for decarbonising um, their portfolios, if they're financial managers or, or corporations that are decarbonising their operations. They pick 2030 because, you know, a uh, Paris-aligned um, trajectory means that, you know, in certainly in developed countries, you, you need to be looking at a halving emissions over the next seven or eight years, which means big changes for businesses and they need to make a bunch of really hard decisions. And then they're presented by organisations like the Network for Greening the Financial System with these IAMs who have not much in terms of sort of a, a practical explication of the kind of the the landscape that these businesses will be navigating over the next seven years. And so I, I think that um, these scenarios, I can imagine them being thrown out in workshops among senior executives or directors to say, look, your um, plans for uh, reducing your emissions over the next seven years, how would they fare in scenario one, the roaring 20s? How would they fare in scenario four, meltdown, where just everything's going to hell in the handbasket? And you can stress test them against these narrative scenarios in a way that it would be really difficult to actually get your head into if you're throwing up, as you say, some um, some charts showing you know various GDP scenarios or the, the relative likelihood of carbon pricing taking off over the next 10 years or not, you know, because they're narrative, you can get your head into them and you can relate to them. And then you can think about what would this mean for my business if, if we were in this or that, that situation? I don't know. I, I think there's something there. I think the other thing to say is that this is a, like a sliver of work. And I think that in some ways it's actually potentially quite unhelpful the way they've presented it because they present this, um, 
seven-step process for scenario construction. And this report really focuses on how they've developed the scenario narratives. They go through in a great deal of detail the process that they went to create these scenarios, but that's step, that's step five out of seven. Yes. And the sixth step is quantify the scenarios. So to the degree possible, put some numbers against them and what they would mean. And yes. we don't get that bit. No. And I can imagine potentially that um, you would be happier tenant if you had that next bit. Maybe so, maybe so. And and when their their full uh, design is is realised, uh, maybe it will be more valuable, uh, more obviously valuable. But I don't know. Like the 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 near termness of the stories and the ex- like the the very strong. Uh, here's all the things that happen-ness of the stories really means that for these to be a uh, decision relevant and, and useful, like they're going to have to be rewritten every year um, comprehensively in a, in a way that more abstract pathways mm. um, won't have to be because they don't try to be of the moment so much. Um, I mean, you know, science fiction stories have uh, this problem of the ever on rushing future, uh, and some of them solve it by um, just writing about the far future, um, so that it won't be a, a relevant problem for all your um, all your world building to be um, outdated, and some of them just accept that they're transient narratives um and i i think you know th- this process has a lot in common with um with science fiction writing and with uh maybe alternate history uh writing um where you're, you're trying to identify a few hinge points that lead to dramatically different worlds and uh i i think those processes always embody a set of ideas about how the world works and um, and values, and this report would be more valuable if it really articulated some of those theories about how the world works, where they can be uh, more clearly seen and contested, because uh, some of them are very plausible and sensible and draw on analysis that we've we've discussed in the past, and some of them I was going. I don't know how these people's minds are working when they uh, come up with <laughs> this particular chain of things. So they, like they've got a bit in their uh, everything's wonderful uh, scenario where better education leads people to support more sustainability by 2030 and the education is better because there's been responsible deployment of AI. They, they were... <laughs> I was very interested in the the trajectory of AI. It featured in all of the scenarios, but mostly for good. It did feel good. a little bit like it had just been wedged in, like at yeah. some point quite late in the process, someone had said, hang on, what have we said about AI? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, because the thing is, you know, no one really knows what AI is. And, I mean, mm. uh, actually that will probably be the, the bit that ages the least well yeah. if we came back to this in, in 10 years would be my guess. I mean, just just on that thing though about the you know people be coming to support sustainability because better they're better educated, blah blah. I actually found that weak and missing from all of the scenario. Well, all of the scenarios that had the kind of good stuff in them, you know, where the world doesn't go to hell in a handbasket. All of those hang off this hook that society over the next seven years becomes much more collectivist. Mm. And much more interested in acting for the common good rather than for sort of um, selfish self-interest. And I have real trouble seeing that happen in in that time frame. Like so, social change takes a really long time. Yes. Um, and that sort of felt like it was – it just felt like it was missing. It, it was a bit of – it's not technology magic. It's like, you know, people's better nature magic was happening or something. Yeah. Look, as – uh, as someone who's just defended this as a potentially useful process, can I say that the actual scenarios, when, as you read through them, sort of came off more as kind of airport lounge boilerplate <laughs> <laughs> rather than in any way, you know, sophisticated or, or, or helpful? I, I think that the scenarios themselves could do with a lot of work, but I think 
the the insight that one could benefit by thinking one's way into um, the next seven years in a, in a more grounded way. And there's a few variables, right? Like mm. they lay out the election cycles in key economies mm. and they are super significant in terms yeah. of the trajectory of the next seven years, which is, you know, as people like to say, the critical decade. Like the way those, th- those elections go, uh, incredibly consequential, I think it is a reasonable point to say that the res- resolution or lack thereof of the war in Ukraine also likely to be incredibly consequential because it's impact on on a whole bunch of things, you know, the you know, enthusiasm for multilateralism, uh, you know, energy markets around the world. These are there's some big consequential swing points that uh, are kind of the hard landscape that we're going to be moving our, our way through as we seek to navigate the next decade. And thinking about that in a in a narrative way, I, I found quite helpful. Yeah, I mean it's it's difficult when you're thinking about the future to think about it not as you would like it to be mm. but as it might actually be like we 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 tend to take a very normative viewpoint to it and I, I think there was a bit of that going on in these scenarios that this is yeah this is sort of what they would like to happen under circumstances where you have a frozen Ukraine con- um, conflict and a Republican president in the US. So there there are a lot of things that that can be argued within those various scenarios. The, the two um, some things are bad and some things are good scenarios, because that's closer to what reality is usually like, um, have a greater sense of realism to them, whereas the... Um, the everything's great scenario often reads like, I don't know, uh, a, a brochure from the Bernie Sanders campaign or something. Uh, <laughs> and the, um, well, I, and, and I found the, the dark scenario insufficiently dark. Well, the, the Roaring Twenties one, which is the positive, strong economy, strong policy one, feels a little bit like all the wishful thinking people do about, you know, Australia, the renewable energy superpower. And when you read through that scenario and you go, these are all the things that need to go right mm. if you want that to come through. Better start working hard, guys. Whereas I think you're right, the other two where it's sort of either markets or policy are strong or weak, Um you know, they felt a little bit more familiar in that you could see things in them that were happening already. Um you know, one of them was sort of saying, oh, some some people start to backslide on their net zero targets. Well, what were we talking about at the beginning of the show? There are more and less plausible things in there. But but also, like, I'm just not sure that there, here's the path to success is by any means the only path to success. Uh, oh, no, of course it's not. No. And and the uh, here's everything falling apart scenario is, is definitely not the only way in which things could fall apart. They seem um, they seem really, really sure for some reason that uh, no matter who wins the uh, 2024 US presidential election, the incentives in the US Inflation Reduction Act are here to stay because they're in the material concrete interest of people in Republican voting electorates. And I don't, like, I don't know, I'm not sure that there's a lot of <laughs> material concrete interests connection visible in the concerns of the primary electorate uh, in the, the Republican race visible so far. Uh, are you saying culture war trumps facts every time? And yeah, well, like people have got very strong feelings. And yeah, no, no, well, and, and people will cut off their nose to spite their face, yeah. right, to, to make a point. Vivek Ramaswamy is making a splash for himself uh, as the uh, we need to emit more carbon emissions. We need to produce and burn more of every kind of fossil fuel and we need to stop these these subsidies uh, argument. Um, he's not going to be the nominee. The nominee for the Republicans is going to be Donald Trump but he could be the vice president candidate. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> oh, everybody knows it. Ron DeSantis, he's dreaming. Ron who? Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, you know, it sounds like Tennant is unconvinced this, that these narrative-based scenarios are useful for, for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but to the degree that they are useful, um, do they have any utility for policymakers? I mean, if you're, if you're in government... Um, uh, if you're trying to think about the resilience of your your policies to a range of of different sort of 
um, plausible pathways uh, that we could take through the next seven or eight years. And, you know, Australia's in the, in the midst of constructing a whole bunch of new policy architecture. Um, should we be thinking about, you know, how that, how that architecture is going to hold up, you know, in a scenario where there's a whole bunch of elections that go against climate action, where there is, you know, protracted, you know, financial headwinds rolling through the world. The economy is not going the way we want it to, where, you know, the, um, uh, the response to uh, repeated um, extreme weather events is not to galvanise action, but to batten down the hatches mm. and kind of look after number one, like the spectre of nationalism creeping ever further into um, into the into global politics, into the dynamic within nations, um, is is one that sort of looms large in some of these scenarios. Is that something that policymakers should be worried about, or just you know? do our best here and hope hope for the best overseas. I think we absolutely need to keep in mind at all times that like the the world is going to be messy and not everything is going to go right and any plan that hinges on absolutely everything going right is not much of a plan at all. But I think we do need to just kind of do our best. And and like uh, planning for some contingencies or 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 aiming for a level of uh, resiliency to surprises and and nasty surprises, but also to good surprises. Uh, like those those are sensible things to try and do. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, and I do think that there are ways for things that people uh, uh, some people may be uncomfortable with to to turn out to be different or or, or, or more positive. We, we have been seeing bad instances of um, nationalist sentiment inducing people to do some some crazy or um, uh, profoundly destructive things in the last few years. We've also seen like uh, nationalist sentiment uh, inspire the people of Ukraine to do uh, like a, a mm. remarkable, Resistance to um, the, the the domination of another power that would deny their their very um, reality as a nation, um, and and you know uh, the, the people of Ukraine are not um, lily white uh, angels um, hovering a few inches above the the golden fields of their native land. They're making mistakes and doing bad things in their human ways too but yeah I, I i don't think that uh success on climate um requires a kind of one world post-material uh <laughs> uh esperanto speaking i think i think there's more ways to come at this than that but i'm not sure that the authors of this uh, paper or their university friends agree Speak up for Esperanto, Alison. <laughs> if you won't speak up for Esperanto, yeah. who will? It, it's not clear in all of these where your social license to do any of it comes from. Mm. You know, in the in the um, the sort of what they call the Roaring Twenties scenario, which is you know everything's go it goes absolutely swimmingly. There's sort of this idea that social norms are going to shift against materialism. Yeah. Um, we're all going to stop eating red meat. We're going to stop driving big cars and living in big homes and consuming fast fashion. And we're going to go in, fa I think they've said, in favour of sharing and circularity, localism and community, social interaction and services, which all sounds very lovely. But also I'm not sure how we get there. And I think there's a little bit of sort of that feels to me more like nostalgia mm. than a useful kind of forecast because there's also later on they sort of in a couple of the scenarios say that the develop populists in the developing world will have this kind of green nationalism yes where they'll you know try and reinforce a, an old cultural norm that had a lower level of consumption rather than western resource intensive lifestyles and that sort of just felt a little bit frankly post-colonialist kind of, you know, longing for the simple savages and their simple mm. lives. Um, 
the other thing actually that was missing from most of these scenarios was much about what happens with migration mm. and whether you get um, significant migration flows. Because one of the things is if you do have – you know, nationalists in developing countries who are like, oh, no, we are all going to sit with our our green national cultural norm. Anyone who is in the slightest bit mobile who wants to live a resource-intensive lifestyle, like a Western lifestyle, is going to up sticks and move to the West. Mm. And you're going to get a great big shift in labour. You're going to get a big shift in consumption. You're going to get a big shift in social attitudes because that that always happens when you get a big influx in my, of migrants. Um so it felt like that was kind of left out. Um, there was a little bit of stuff about climate migration in the meltdown scenario, but not a lot. Yeah. Clearly, I'm feeling very grumpy about this report and maybe uh, I will be proven wrong in uh, the parts two through infinity <laughs> of of it. The climate scenario franchise that we all needed. <laughs> That's right. Superheroes are over. Climate scenarios are the multimedia megaplex of the 2020s. All the kids are into climate scenarios yes, these days. Is. Absolutely. So I just wanted to to say that, you know, having done all this, this criticism of, of simplistic uh, IAMs, just put in a good word for obviously – simplified modelling and scenarios. And I'm not going to say a good word directly for William Nordhaus. I will say instead uh, the th- that paper on uh, learning rates from last year um, by Rupert Way et al., and Rupert Way was one of the people consulted for this report, so love your work, Rupert, and all your friends at the... <laughs> Uh, 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 the, what is it, the Smith School? At Oxford, yep. They presented in that learning rates paper not just their complex-ish um, way of getting from historical data on learning rates to projections of where learning rates may go, but then they had a few illustrative scenarios for world development uh, and and therefore how much deployment and therefore where, where costs for these technologies would go. And it was a very simple model uh, mm. of the like world energy systems. Very simple. And in that simplicity, it is much harder to mistake it for a crystal ball. It's not mm. impossible and people are, are always looking for a crystal ball. Um, but if you if you give something that uh, like is so abstract uh, that is even though it's unsatisfactory, at least it helps can remind people that they are not really looking at uh, a firm prediction of the future, but just at something that is bringing out a couple of relationships and factors of interest and illustrating the, the way that they interact. We think they interact with each other and like that's useful. And I'd contrast that with uh what I would call the dwarf fortress approach and the psychohistory approach. <laughs> dwarf fortress is a possibly the nerdiest video game in the world today, which is uh, a ludicrously complex series of interlocking simulation elements of generating procedurally a fantasy world and running a little dwarven colony in it to the point where it generates its own musical forms and kinds of musical instrument. and um, It sounds hideous. Who did this to humanity? Oh, it's wonderful. (laughs) One guy and his brother working in an apartment for like 15 years off donation. Can we stop them before they breed or make any friends? I can promise you there's no danger of breeding. (laughs) Yeah, God. But it's, it's wonderful but also... Uh, like the the more detail you put into a thing, the more ways it can go wrong and depart from yes. reality. Yep. And that is Dwarf Fortress all over. And then psychohistory yep. is the fictional science of predicting the uh, behaviour of very large groups of people in Isaac Asimov's Foundation novels, now a an Apple TV Plus series in which things occasionally threaten to happen but never quite do. 
and uh, that is like you can mathematically uh, work things out so well that a thousand years later people will think that uh, all is lost and then a holographic recording of you, the ultimate mathematician, <laughs> will play and explain how to resolve the crisis that you have foreseen. Hologrammatic William Nordhaus or something. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. And I think a lot of people have that hope in mind for modeling exercises and we're just never going to get there. So make do with the abstract. Well, I mean, I think one thing on that, on the timeframes, I think well, one thing that was good about this paper is it's it's only to 2030 and that actually feels a lot easier to deal with. But one of the things about long-term integrated assessment models is they do go a long way into the future and so it can be very easy to kind of go, well, that's a very, very future, you know, that's future tenants problem or, you know, tenants descendants problem. Mm. Because this one is only out to 2030, that is within the horizon of most of us. You know, most of us have ambitions for 2030 or hopes or dreams or business plans or, or whatever else. And the only way that we're actually going to get this problem under control is probably in a, in a series of kind of short sprints, right, mm. of periods of action of, of shorter amounts of time within a horizon that we can reasonably grapple with as people. Yes. And I think that was actually a strength in this is that they're only talking about between now and 2030. And uh, blimey, there's a long list of stuff that you need to do between now and 2030. But we all knew that. But it's kind of nice to see it all written down in one place. Yes. And whatever the deficiencies of the scenarios themselves, I think something that was, I think, very powerful for me, and it sounds like it was for you as well, Alison was the chapter on the physical climate narrative to 2030. So, you know, more frequent and intense extreme weather events. It sort of is flat on the, the page. But when you've got three or four, five pages of just the world going to hell in the proverbial handbasket in 2023, um, you know, emergence of El Nino in 2024. The world confronts the challenges of a super El Nino event. Southern Africa and India experience prolonged droughts. South America experiences extreme floods. Um, and it goes on and on and on. And it is very careful to say these are not the specific things that will happen, but things like this are very likely to happen mm. and continue happening over the next seven years. So as I think practitioners and professionals in climate policy, I think it is really uh, behooves us to think about how that reality, that is the new reality, is going to impact decision making, whether it's political decision making or decision making of, of citizens that are grappling with just a, an incredibly chaotic world that is, is, is in flux, um, because that's what we're going to have to deal with. And I think that actually um, engaging with that in this format is, is far more powerful than you know, looking at you know the the probability of you know um, these these events occurring in a much in a much drier fashion, which is the way that they're often presented. And I think this came out sort of in the last scenario, the um, meltdown one. To some extent, what happens in that scenario? It's not just that we can't all get our acts together. It's also because this volatility in the, in the global environment largely because of all of these extreme weather events means that people just get into firefighting mode mm. um, and are just making short-term decisions and short-term decisions and short-term decisions. And what you see in the fourth scenario is how all of that just starts to compound and actually make things worse ra rather than better. Yeah. And there was something weird in that final scenario. It was the only one where they got very uppity about how people spend their leisure time and said, you know, we're all, you know, going to be seeking solace in online gaming and social media. Tenants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and drugs and gambling. So if, if like me, you're not into online gaming, um, there'll be drugs and gambling for you. That's always a backup plan. There is, yeah. there is one more narrative in here um, that is touched on lightly that I wouldn't mind unpacking. It's not one of the key narratives, but it is the narrative about why policymakers aren't building these at more, more complex risks and variables into their into their models, you know, politics and policy, technology progress, behavioural, social change. And I quote, 
they're reluctant to include subjective or controversial drivers because um, policymakers are too politically correct. They, it's all too hard. They don't want to, you know, really grapple with the implications of a, you know, a Trump election win in twenty twenty four. That would be that would be too hard. So they say in the safe cradling arms of William Nordhaus and his integrated assessment models as a result. Um, are policymakers too politically correct? Is that a thing? I think it's certainly in public, you know, no no government is ever going to come out and say, oh, I hope Donald Trump doesn't win the, the, the election because that is bad for our relationship with the United States. And, you know, traditionally you don't do that. You don't comment on elections in other people's countries and so on. I would bet you London to a brick that that it gets said in private. Yeah. So I think there's a there is a big gap here between what governments are saying within themselves to themselves and what they're prepared to say in public. Yeah. I think that's right. And the what a side effect of that is that the the public facing work from governments is is quite anodyne. Mm. Uh, and both for the the international diplomatic reasons, and like they won't they won't speculate about themselves getting the collie wobbles. Or I think it's called the Sunex. <laughs> <laughs> Vote for us, or you'll all be stuck with online gaming and drugs and gambling. <laughs> Look, the authors of this paper need to spend some more time playing online games. They might have a more mellow attitude. <laughs> Bit of dwarf fortress. Bit of dwarf we'll fortress. <laughs> It's got a new graphic interface. It's so much more welcoming than when it was all ASCII character-based graphics. Uh As always, we close out the show with one more thing in which we all share something that is currently captivating our attention. Alison, what have you got? I just wanted to note that South Australian Parliament last week passed the change to the national energy laws, so we now have an emissions reduction objective in the national um, electricity law and the national gas law. Yay! Um, so this means AEMO and AER and AEMC, etc., the people who make the rules and enforce the rules and so on, have to consider the achievements of targets set by a participating jurisdiction for reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. And they have to do that alongside all the other things they have, like best interests of consumers and so on. The AMC has been quick off the mark to put out a guidance note about how they're going to apply it. Uh, I think people are hoping this is going to make it easier to do things like the RIT-T test for transmission and so on. And there's also going to be guidance coming from the federal government on how market bodies are to value emissions reduction when they need to put a number on it, Hmm. Um, which sounds a lot to me like a cost of carbon. Shh. <laughs> no, one, no one listens to this, do they? <laughs> they could uh, just borrow the methodology from the New South, New South Wales, Wales Treasury. Yeah. They've got a handy dandy one ready for borrowing. I think it says just value it at the EU ETS spot price, which is a thing you can do. Very exciting. All right. Uh, tenant, what have you got? I wish to highlight the recent release uh, by the Victorian government of a consultation paper on renewable gas, uh, which is out for consultation till the 6th of October. So get your skates on by the time you hear this. Ah, that means I need to write a submission. Yes. (laughs) Yes, you do. Uh, Oh. So many feelings. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, it, this paper was a little bit long for consideration uh, for a uh, an episode of this podcast, but it considers a lot of issues around renewable gas. The state is looking at maybe adopting a target to mandate or some other policy to mandate a certain amount of renewable gas, biogas or hydrogen to be made. They have uh, industrial uses in mind for that. And, you know, there's some interesting questions involved, like how much and who pays? And who pays might might get a lot of attention. Uh, but uh, that is an interesting one and a, a sign that the state government's perfectly serious in saying electrification's not the only thing they're looking at, even though they think it is the answer for RESI, uh, there are additional problems to be solved around industrial uses of natural gas and 
this is one of the tools that they're looking at for that. So get on it. So how does this interact with the timeline for the gas substitution roadmap? Because that's due before the end of the year. <laughs> that is an excellent question, Luke, <laughs> and one that was perhaps not adequately answered at the public consultation. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> uh, the gas substitution roadmap version two, uh, due by the end of the year, <laughs> will not be the final version of the gas substitution roadmap a living Isn't document. Another franchise? It is. Like a- <laughs> yes. That's right. Substitute harder. Substitute with a vengeance. A good day to substitute. Live free or substitute. Where does it end? I think it ends with the retirement of the heat John McClain. <laughs> In- who is the who is the John McLean of the uh, gas substitution roadmap? Team? I'm not sure we've yet found uh, our true John McLean. <laughs> the, the hero hasn't risen. I think there there are some listeners to this podcast who are desperately hoping that they're going to get a shout out right now, but we're not going to give it to you. <laughs> I think you you can't be the John McLean of gas substitution till you've done the gas substitution equivalent of running across broken glass in bare feet. Uh, to uh, rescue your estranged wife. I'm biting my tongue here. (laughs) You want to write some speculative fiction. (laughs) I'll also write fan fan fiction on the Cat Substitution Roadmap as as Die Hard. (laughs) No. All right, I'll save us from this by sharing my one more thing. Uh, I wanted to give a shout-out to a game I stumbled upon at the Games Lab at the Australian Centre for the Moving Image called Umarangi Generation, in which cyberpunk and anime aesthetics collide with a landscape shaped by climate disaster. Uh, It's a game from a Maori developer, Napthali Faulkner, whose home was destroyed in Black Saturday bushfires and who has funneled that experience into the creation of a post-apocalyptic first-person shooter with a difference Uh, because you're photographing the landscape rather than trying to shoot people um, and uh, curating that post-apocalyptic chaos. It's very unusual. It's pretty interesting. I didn't get a whole lot of time with it because despite my best efforts, my 10-year-old son was more interested in playing Street Fighter (laughs) 2 than Warangi Generation. Um, Sounds unrealistic. I I don't believe this is a real child. (laughs) But it's on Steam. So uh, if your gamer tastes skew indie with a garnish of climate catastrophe... It could be for you, and we'll include a link to the game itself in the show notes as well as uh, some sites where you can find out a little bit more about it if you yourself are not a gamer but are intrigued by the idea. Sounds like just the apotheosis of self-oriented, divorced from the world, (laughs) online gaming. I'm... Drugs and gambling. horrified. (laughs) No fast fashion. Where's the dwarves? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Where are the dwarves? Won't someone oh. think of the dwarves? <laughs> that is our show for today. <laughs> uh, look, we're all on social media. Come find us and, and have a yarn. I'm not going to inquire as to uh, the state of health of the various social networks. They're all out there. Um, my daughter was telling me the other day, you're pretty good on video. Why don't you, why don't you get onto uh, the old TikTok Mm. Um, and she reckons that's the new frontier. <laughs> we, have, we have trouble keeping the podcast to an hour. We're not going to get it down for three minutes. <laughs> yes, yes. I am on Blue Sky now, by the way. Oh, for anyone who's, oh anyone who's that's, that's the hipster social network right there. It's so nice over there. It's like Twitter was in 2010. The great thing about it is that it's no good as a distraction when you're meant to be doing something else because there's so few people on that <laughs> that when you log on, nothing's changed. <laughs> The true KPI of any social network. So it would be great to have more more people on there, but not too many, please. <laughs> okay, okay. So am I, are Tennant and I allowed to join you in your nice little hidey hole? Um, you will have to find someone who can give you an invitation. But yeah, <laughs> okay. I, I don't have any of the like secret codes or anything yet. So, all right. Well, maybe that's something listeners can help us out with. Uh, look, if listeners have 
codes to Blue Sky to send us tenants, uh, where should they direct them to? I guess, I'm not sure if it really works like this, but they should send them to <laughs> mailbag at letmesumup.net and then we'll, uh, I don't know, like bang them together like the apes at the start of 2001 A Space Odyssey. <laughs> Uh, good. Okay. Uh, and uh, Alison, uh, if someone was interested in uh, perusing our back catalogue of episodes, where where would you direct them? You are testing me again, aren't you? <laughs> Can't tell me you've forgotten. <laughs> it's letmesumup.net. Yeah, that wasn't a test. <laughs> that was just the shtick of the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> letmesumup.net for the full back catalogue of quality content such as you are listening to right now. <laughs> I love it. Okay, for Alison Reeve and Tenant Reed, I'm Luke Menzel. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again soon. It's a cursed Monday. Have you had, like, <laughs> you know, isn't it, it's like retrograde mercury or something? I haven't had a great day, honestly. There uh-uh. you go. It's cursed Monday. Spirit of Garfield is with us all. <laughs> that, that, that could be uh, your persona at uh, next year's great debate performance, Tenant. <laughs> <laughs> Fat ginger and carrying a lasagna, like, (laughs) what?